talk about delivery room handling. And uh, here is the outline of my, uh, my lecture. So I will, after some introduction, I will show you some recent outcome data. I will tell you why in a, in a minute. And uh, also mention some prenatal factors that are of importance for the delivery room handling and outcome. And uh, then I will continue with the uh, uh, heart rate assessment, uh, whether we should suction or not. Um, I will not talk about uh, ventilation very much, just mention a few words about uh, sustained inflation and show you some results and cord clamping, heat loss prevention. Um, oxygen is my next lecture, so I will not talk about oxygenation in this lecture. So, we talk about uh, the golden minute or the golden minutes and that's about what we are doing in the delivery room. So what we are doing in the delivery room during a few minutes we know has such vast consequences potentially for, for many newborn babies. And I've listed um <coughs> some factors here that are of importance, cord clamping, peep, surfactant, temperature control, oxygen, uh, which are of importance for the outcome. Um, but, let's see, but it's also antenatal factors, so we'll come back to that, are also of importance. And of course, as neonatologists, we are also interested in, in the postnatal uh, care and, and the outcome, which uh, also is important. Now, <laughs> according to ILCOR, 85% of all newborn babies, they start to breed spontaneously without any help uh, within 10 to 30 seconds. However, 10% respond, uh, need some drying and stimulation, and uh, approximately 3%, at least in my country, need some help with positive pressure ventilation. It might be different in Ukraine and other countries. 3 to 5% would need uh, bag and mask ventilation. And according to ILCOR, 2% uh, of newborn babies need intubation. I, I find this uh, number a little bit high. I don't know what you feel, but this is what ILCOR uh, says. And uh, very few will require chest compressions and or adrenaline, what we call advanced uh, <coughs> resuscitation. Now, here is the ILCOR uh, algorithm for newborn resuscitation from 2010, and in 2010 they introduced the concept of the golden minute, the first sec 60 seconds of life. And I will not go through the algorithm, I'll talk more about that tomorrow. Uh, but uh, an important question is, when is the golden minute? Ilko doesn't define that. And when you go into um, to other guidelines, it's not defined. This is uh, of importance when talking about the first 60 seconds. Which 60 seconds are we talking about? And we also need to know when the first minute is, because we are doing the APCA score at one minute. So, some would answer it's when the shoulders are out, we should start the clock, or when the cord is cut, if you have seen that also, this answer, but that doesn't make any sense uh, today when we are delaying the cord clamping. And uh, maybe on the recitation table, I have to admit in my own practice that many, t many times I started the clock when the baby was in front of me, and that's too late. It is when the whole baby is out. So I, I think we should agree on that. And as a neonatologist, it takes maybe 20, 30, 40, 60 seconds before we have the baby in front of us, and then the golden minute is already done. <coughs> so what, this is a close-up of the golden minute. So what are we supposed to do in the golden minute? Well, the first 30 seconds, we should dry the baby, we should keep the baby warm, we should wrap it in plastic if it's less than 28 weeks, so we put it into a plastic bag without drying, it's important. We should stimulate the baby to breathe if that is needed, and we should position the airways correctly, and we should record heart rate and 
respiratory rate. So that's what we should do with the first 30 seconds. And in the, the next 30 seconds, we should establish respiratory support if that is needed. And if you have a pulse oximeter, you should have the pulse oximeter on. Now, for everybody who has been working as neonatologists knows that this is not easy. And it has been studied. It's not easy to do this, achieve this during the first 60 seconds, the golden minute. <coughs> now I'll switch gear a little bit, because these are data from the so-called e-newborn re registry. That's a relatively new European database for babies less than 1,501 grams or less than 32 weeks. <coughs> and the reason I uh, show this is, one, there are no Ukrainian units are taking part of this registry. So I'm here also, I'm trying to recruit units from Ukraine to send their information to the, this database. So I would try to show you how useful this is. <coughs> here we have a distribution. We have 40,000 babies now in the database from 2014. And here we have the distribution uh, regarding gestational age. And you see we have the babies as small as 22 weeks. And you see here we have the peak at 31 weeks. Now, this is just to show you how mortality is for these babies in Europe, or for those who are registering in, in the e newborn. And you can see how this is an exponential curve. So when gestation age decreases, you see how mortality increases for 22 weeks here. It's, it's very high. And here we have the odds ratio for mortality. And again, you see here, this is, with, if I had put 22 weeks here, it will be up here. But it's uh, 23 weeks. You see 40 fold increased risk. Um, so we also know that uh, females are doing better than, than males. And this uh, we can show here, see that females, they have a lower uh, mortality than boys. And we also know that growth uh, restriction, small for gestational age, is of importance for the outcome, uh, especially for those who are extremely small for gestational age at the three percentile. Here's the tenth percentile, here's the th uh, third percentile. So these are risk factors for the outcome. So coming back to the, the delivery room, there are a number of maternal factors we should also take into account, and I have listed a few of them here. Uh, body mass index, curiamnionitis, antenatal steroids. And I would like to just show you, this is a um, meta-analysis we published in YAMA some years ago, showing the relation between prenatal mortality and BMI of the mother at the start of the pregnancy. And you can see that the perinatal mortality increases like this with the BMI. And we did the same for fetal mortality, neonatal mortality, and even infant mortality. It's related to the BMI. And this means this is out of the scope of neonatology, but it tells us that it's important to inform the, the women, women before they're pregnant that maybe they should try to reduce their BMI if possible. What about the use of antenatal steroids? Well, this is from the registry, European registry. And you see that up to 90% of the babies around 24 weeks, 95% may get some steroids. But not all of them get a complete course of steroids. You see here, this is an incomplete. Here it's the maybe 60% receives a complete course. Does it matter? Well, it probably matters. But when you look at mortality, even if you get an incomplete course of antenatal steroids, it reduces mortality. And this has now been shown by others also. So it tells us that, yes, even if we don't have time to complete the antenatal steroid course, we should start it even if there's only a few hours before we 
expect the delivery. And I will also mention a few words about the mode of delivery. Um, C-section rate is very high in many countries. I don't know what it is in Ukraine, but it has been estimated that if a C-section rate is about 10%, it doesn't reduce the mortality. It might reduce morbidity, of course. In Norway, C-section rate is around 17, 18%. What is it in Ukraine? Anyone tell me? It varies, probably. Hmm? 50? 80s. 15. 15. 15, okay. So the same as in Norway. So that's good. Because we know that if you do a C-section before term, it increases morbidity. And here I, I listed a number of outcome measures, transfer to the NICU, uh, transitory tachypnea, uh, RDS, need of CPAP, hypoglycemia. So it's not until 39, 40 weeks that there is no increased morbidity. And here we have serious respir respiratory morbidity. You see that at um, 39, 40 weeks, there's no increased morbidity. So this is important. And as neonatologists, I think um, we have to inform the society and our colleagues, obstetricians, about this. That we don't, we don't want babies to be delivered by C-section -se if it's not strictly needed. Okay, heart rate assessment. How should we assess the heart rate at birth? Well, ILCOR, in the last recommendation from 2015, they don't recommend uh, ECG, but they suggest to use ECG. How many of you are using ECG to assess heart rate in the delivery room? Nobody. I travel around a lot, all over the world, and I ask this question, and I haven't seen one single hand up. So, in my opinion, these recommendations or suggestions from ILCOR are premature because this is not how we do it. Maybe in the future, but so, so far we should use other methods to assess heart rate. Uh, let's, um, you can hardly read this, but this is a, a study published some years ago from, from the Netherlands uh, showing how the heart rate is recorded by ECG, the blue here, uh, uh, the blue by a pulse oximeter and, and the green by ECG. And you can see that the pulse oximeter is slow. And the first measurements are not reliable, and we know that. ECG is faster, and new technology may pick up ECG signals already after seven seconds, very fast after delivery. The problem is that many beats are not recorded, up to 30%. But there will be new technology which makes it easier to assess uh, <coughs> heart rate. But so far, I think, I think that stethoscopy is still um, what we should choose when we are assessing heart rate at birth. Um, <coughs> together with Roger Sol, I, I wrote a commentary recently in the Neonatology about this because we disagreed with ILCOR's recommendations or suggestions using ECG. So we, we say we should still use the, st the stethoscope for heart rate assessment. I would like to hear your opinion about that afterwards. Suctioning or wiping. When I started in pediatrics and neonatology many years ago, we sectioned a lot. We sectioned every baby after C-section, and we were very active, and w we thought we were doing a good job, but we probably didn't. And Ilkor, in 2010, said that this, you don't need to suction routinely, not even if there is meconium stain amniotic fluid. So suctioning is not needed routinely, and um, even if there is meconium stained amniotic fluid, to suction or not to suction is a clinical decision. Um, 
So you have to, f to decide if it's needed. And why shouldn't we suction routinely? Well, partly because of these results here, where they measured the oxygen saturation the first minutes of life, and you can see that the first six minutes of life, the saturation is significantly decreased when you suction routinely. This is from vaginal deliveries, but same results after C-section. So no routine suctioning anymore. And uh, this study from Alabama, Wally Carlos group, was published some years ago in The Lancet, where they randomized babies to be suctioned routinely or to just to wipe the mouth and uh, nose with a, a, a tissue, with a cloth, and the outcome was respiratory rate, and you see there's no difference the first 24 hours. So, uh, so that makes it easy for us. A um, few words about ventilation. Um, in the, if we go back to the European uh, database, the registry, uh, we, we know exactly how many of these babies, less than 1,500 grams, that needed resuscitation and, uh, per week. And here you see that for 24 weeks, 90% needed resuscitation, and then it decreases like this. But we had to distinguish between basic resuscitation and advanced. Basic newborn resuscitation is bag and mask ventilation. Advanced is intubation, chest compression, use of adrenaline, volume. So you see that very few of these babies, the smallest babies, need uh, basic resuscitation. And the reason for that is that We'll see in a, in a second that they need advanced resuscitation. As you see here, for those who are resuscitated, the smallest one, they need advanced resuscitation. Now, does it matter for the outcome? Yes. Well, if you just do basic resuscitation, bag and max ventilation, it doesn't influence mortality. And that is good to know. However, those babies who need advanced resuscitation, they have a higher mortality, which is not <coughs> surprising, of course. They are sicker uh, in the first place. <coughs> uh, okay, there's something missing here, but this is about sustained inflation. I'll just say a few words uh, about sustained inflation, because there was uh, <coughs> recently a, a Cochrane review about that. How many of you are practicing sustained inflation? Nobody. So oh, that's good. Well, anyway, uh, this Cochrane review, they conclude that sustained inflation was not better than intermittent ventilation for reducing mortality in the delivery room and during hospitalization, need for intubation, need for or duration of respiratory support, or bronchopulmonary dysplasia, we found no evidence of relevant benefit for sustained inflation over intermittent ventilation. The duration of mechanical ventilation was shortened in <coughs> sustained lung inflation. <coughs> this result should be interpreted cautiously, as it can be influenced by study characteristics other than the intervention. And we need more randomized studies as always is concluded. However, one run of my studies, uh, the so-called uh, SAIL study, uh, well, it's not here, but it's, uh, uh, which was a study about sustained inflation, was stopped because of adverse effects in the sustained inflation group. So sustained inflation uh, should not be used uh, routinely, in my opinion, uh, only if you are following a protocol. Now, when should we cut the cord? <coughs> There's been a lot of discussion about that, uh, and uh, I'm sure that also here everybody has moved to delayed cord clamping. Um, and um, the reason for that is this has been known for, for many, many years. This is a, st uh, a study published uh, 50 years ago showing that two thirds of the uh, fetal. Uh, placenta circulation is in the baby at birth, and one third is in the placenta. For preterm babies, it, it's even higher. Up to 50% of the blood is in the placenta. So 
it is important to wait to get a transfusion from the placenta to the baby, and how long should we wait? Well, this is uh, a study in healthy term babies, where they put the babies on the balance and they just measured how the, the weight increased. And you see after 60 seconds, 70% of, of the blood had been transfused to the baby. And I guess this is one reason people say, yes, we should wait, we should delay the cord clamping, and we can wait for 60 seconds. Because there's not much to gain if we wait another 60 seconds. So most of it has been done within 60 seconds. Now, <coughs> another issue that is discussed a lot now is, should we wait with the cord clamping until the baby has started to breathe? And the reason for that is that there's some interesting animal data, especially from Stuart Hooper's lab in Melbourne. This is from newborn lambs, and here you can see that they have they clamped the cord here before ventilation was started. Here's the blood pressure. You see the blood pressure increases. Here's the carotid uh, artery flow. It increases. So if you clamp the cord before the, the baby has started to breathe, uh, the baby is more instable hemodynamically. By contrast, if you, you wait, you clamp the cord after uh, ventilation has started, you see that the transition here is much smoother. Now, should we therefore wait till the baby has started to breathe before we clamp the cord, or should we just say 60 seconds or 30 seconds? Well, I think we need some more studies before we can implement this in the, in the daily practice. But I think absolutely it is an attractive idea that we should wait till the baby has started to breathe. Uh, very recently, a year ago, um, a large study was published from Australia, uh, the Australian Placental Transfusion Study. And the aim of this study was to compare death and morbidity at the age of 36 weeks uh, gestation. And they included 1,600 babies, less than 30 weeks. And they were randomized to immediate cord clamping, that is within 10 seconds, or delayed cord clamping, they waited for 60 seconds or more while holding the baby below the placenta or incision. So what did they find? Well, primary outcome, which was death uh, or major morbidity by 36 weeks, showed absolutely no difference. It didn't matter whether you clamped earlier or late which was a little bit disappointing, perhaps. But when they looked at death, I don't know if you can see this, but there was a 30% reduction in mortality when you delay the cord clamping. And that is quite dramatic the result, I think. Now, these uh, same authors, they, they published a meta-analysis of the same topic at the same time as they published their randomized study. And uh, I'll show you some of the results. <coughs> so here they had babies less than 37 weeks. And they compared the outcome of babies with delayed cord clamping, now defined as 30 seconds or more, compared to those who close to uh, clamp the cord before 30 seconds. And uh, babies less than 37 weeks, I mentioned that. and. Uh, <laughs> This is what they found, uh, the 19 trials. Um, and if you look down here, and this is um, um, mortality. And, and you see, again, there was a 30% reduction in mortality by just waiting uh, some seconds before you clamp the cord. 19 trials, almost 3,000 babies, and mortality was reduced well, the risk of mortality was reduced 32%, which is quite dramatic. So delayed clamping also reduced the number of blood transfusions given to the infants, but it increased the incidence of polycythemia 
as well as jaundice. Now, I heard some, uh, and uh, uh, there will be a topic uh, covering jaundice uh, later on, but I, I've received co uh, letters from colleagues, for instance, in South America, Brazil. They're, they're concerned about this because many places they cannot measure jaundice, they cannot measure bilirubin, and they cannot treat it. So they're afraid that we get more injury because of this. I haven't seen any reports about that, but I just mentioned it. Uh, so that could be uh, a drawback by this, delayed cord clamping. Delayed clamping had no significant effect on maternal hemorrhage or blood transfusion. Low APCA scores at one or five minutes. Uh, the need for neonatal recitation or intubation. The temperature on admission interventricular hemorrhage or periventricular leukomalacia. And that is interesting because um, a recent Cochrane review showed that delayed cord clamping in preterm babies reduces interventricular hemorrhage. They couldn't find it in this, this study. Necrotizing enterocolitis, chronic lung disease, or ROP was not affected. Now the next question is, should we resuscitate babies with an intact cord? It is possible to do that, as shown here. Here's the baby, here's the cord, here's the mother. So now we have speci special trolleys where you, it's possible to do this. And is it worthwhile to do that? Well, um, um, a group from San Diego, Cataria, um, there's something of the text is not coming up here, but anyway, they did a randomized study. Um, and these are baby, small babies. Um, less than um, uh, 23 to, to, uh, to, to 31 weeks or something like that, preterm babies. So they were randomized to resuscitation with an intact cord or delayed cord clamping and then resuscitation. And this is a very busy slide. There's a lot of hemodynamic variables. But what you can see here is that there's absolutely no difference between the two groups. So, um, so here is, for instance, an upper here panel here is the blood pressure. Absolutely no difference. Um, so the the authors concluded that ventilation plus delayed cord clamping was feasible, but did not lead to any measurable clinical improvements immediately after delivery or reduce subsequent neonatal morbidity, caretakers should consider providing adequate stimulation before, before cord clamping. What about cord milking? Well, it's possible and, and here's described and if you go into this website, you can see how it is done uh, and here's how we should do it. Um, and here's cord clamping versus cord milking um, so this was a study in babies between 24 and 28 weeks uh, where cord milking was tested versus immediate cord clamping and they found less transfusion, need of transfusion after cord milking uh, the first 28 days, higher hematocrit and now they found less interventricular hemorrhage, uh, 25 versus 51% relative risk of 0.49. So it's a dramatic reduction in interventricular hemorrhage. Um, this was published five years ago. Cord milking versus delayed cord clamping showed no difference. Seems to be equal. That means that if you are in an emergency situation, you may do cord milking, then clamp the cord and do the resuscitation. But we need more studies, I would say. But then, <coughs> was a follow-up, cord milking versus delayed cord clamping. Um, and uh, then, what you see here is that the cognitive score was significantly higher after cord milking compared with delayed cord clamping, <laughs> making it more difficult for us. Should we then start to co do cord milking? Also, language score was higher. Well, I think we need more studies. But I would like to hear your opinion about that before we change practice. Where should we position the baby before we clamp the cord? High or low? 
Uh, well, this study by Nestor Wayne from, from uh, Argentina, published some years ago, showed that it doesn't matter. So you can, p you and f f at least for me, coming from Scandinavia, where we want to, to put the baby on the stomach of the mother as soon as possible, it seems that we can put the baby on the stomach even before you cut the cord, clamp the cord. Okay, so that was um, cord clamping, and um, I'll uh, finish talking a, a little bit about heat loss prevention. So this is the ILCOR algorithm for 2015, and here they have introduced this line, and here it said maintain temperature. So this is to remind us that during the whole procedure, during recitation or stabilization, we should remember that we should keep the baby, uh, keep it warm. Temperature control. Well, I think most of us now, we are putting the smallest babies into plastic bags, less than 28 weeks, and we should do that before we dry them, uh, and we hope that it can decrease morbidity and mortality. Here are some uh, recommendations from the, the European recommendations. Um, 2016, maintain core temperature between 36.5 and 37.5 at all times. And this is just a suggestion for 2019. Um, and it's identical. Um, and for babies less than 32 weeks, delivery room temperature 23 to 25 degrees, and for less than 28 weeks, the room temperature should be 26 degrees. That's not easy, uh, <coughs> because the obstetricians very often say it's too hot. We don't want it to be 26 degrees in, in the operating room. Now, <coughs> does, it <coughs> does it work to put babies into plastic bags? Well, there was a Cochrane review uh, published in 2010, and um, and here is um, death, and what you can see here, it doesn't work. There's a tendency to re reduction in mortality, but it's not at all significant. And that is, of course, disappointing. And for major brain injury, absolutely no difference whether you put the baby into plastic bags or not. And um, this is a, a recent study, or came out some years ago now, uh, from US, also looking at the outcome after putting uh, small babies into plastic bags. Yes, body temperature was higher, but there was no effect on outcome, except for pulmonary hemorrhage, which was reduced. And then, very recently, a new Cochrane review came out, concluding the same. Uh, and uh, does it mean that, so here is the, yeah, I don't think I will read it, but, but just here, evidence was insufficient to suggest that plastic wraps or bags significantly reduce risk of death during hospital stay or other major morbidities, with the exception of reducing risk of pulmonary hemorrhage. Does it mean that we should stop putting babies into plastic bags? No, I don't think so. I think we should still aim at keeping the temperature normal. But the reason this doesn't work is probably that those babies who are hypothermic, they have other diseases, they are, they are sicker than the other babies. That's the reason they have a higher mortality, probably. But of course, we want to aim to keep the babies warm um, in spite of that. And then I will just end up with uh, some of the WHO recommendations that came out in 2015, because um, they were very um, focused on thermal control in the guidelines for preterm babies 2015. And it says that kangaroo mother care <coughs> is recommended for the routine care of neonates <coughs> weighing less than two kilos at birth. 
<coughs> as soon as they are clinically stable. Neonates weighing less than two kilo at birth should be provided as close to continuous kangaroo mother care as possible and intermittent kangaroo ca mother care rather than conventional care is recommended for newborns weighing less than two kilo at birth if continuous kangaroo mother care is not possible. And I think this is uh, uh, something we should uh, focus on even in Europe, kangaroo mother care. So I just want to end by showing the present European recommendations for delivery room handling. Uh, and the reason I show it to you is to not only to remind you about these recommendations, but also because we are now in the process of making the new guidelines, which are planned to be, uh, be uh, published next year. So if, if any one of you have inputs, please come to me and I, I will, uh, I will uh, take care of that. Um, so delay cord clamping for at least 60 seconds. I think we agree on that. Cord milking is an alternative where delayed cord clamping is not possible. Well, I didn't talk about oxen yet, so I skipped that because that's uh, in the afternoon. Um, in breeding babies, stabilized with CPAP over at least six centimeter water via mask or nasal prongs, gentle infl inflations using about 20 to 25 centimeter water. Peak inspiratory pressure should be used for persistently apneic or bradycardic infants. Intubation should be reserved for babies who have not responded to post depressive ventilation via face mask. Babies who require intubation for stabilization should be given surfactant. Plastic bags or occlusive wrapping under radiant warmer should be used during stabilization in the delivery suite for babies less than 28 <coughs> weeks. Gestation to reduce the risk of hypothermia. So th that, th that's how the present guidelines are. I think that was it, and uh, this is n not a mountain named after me, but maybe a distant relative. But I think it's a beautiful Mount Saugstad. So I would thank you for the attention, and I appreciate to, uh, if you have comments or questions. Can you tell me, please, uh, cord milking? Does it affect the frequency of polycythemia, necrotizing enterocolitis developing in children? Thank you. Um, whether cord milking uh, 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 influence polycythemia, I, to be honest, I, I don't uh, remember if this was recorded in, in the study. I have to look it up for you. Uh, but I guess it, uh, you'll get the same results regarding polycythemia for cord milking as for delayed uh, cord clamping. Anyone who can help me answering this question? Steve, do you know? Yeah. The thing that is confusing to me is why the hematocrit should be different. Um, the blood that is in the placenta has the same hematocrit as the blood that's in the baby. So while blood volume might be increased, there shouldn't really be any change in hematocrit. And I think Neil and I were discussing this, that to remember that polycythemia and hyperviscosity are not the same. Mm -hmm. So there may be a change in viscosity without a change in hematocrit that could contribute to stasis in the mesenteric bed and theoretically increase the risk of necrotizing enterocolitis. Well, anyway, I, I haven't seen any, any data showing that it increases risk of, uh, of uh, necrotizing enterocolitis. But I'm sorry, I cannot answer your question uh, better. Пожалуйста, еще вопросы. Thank you very much for, for your very best presentation. What do you say um, about my questions? I have only one question to you. you know, this year, uh, in SPIN conference in Lübeck, you know, uh, Angela Krips presented a very interesting speech about uh, stabilization very premature baby. Mm. And she um, uh, showed a very interesting video 
uh, she show very uh, interesting stabili stabilization in delivery room without any manipulations in court and placenta. And placenta placed near the baby. And uh, the teams uh, wait until baby is still breathing. Uh, what do you say, what your personal opinion about very maybe dangerous manipulation for like this? Thank you. Yeah, well, I was also present and listened to Angela's uh, lecture, and I've been visiting her in Cologne. Cologne. Uh, and what she's doing is that she's not doing much, she's waiting and, and giving. And she's also talking about uh, transition, stabilization instead of resuscitation, which I think is important. Most of these babies are not resuscitated, they just need some help f for the transition. Uh, I don't remember exactly when she was clamping the cord, uh, but, uh, but she probably waited a long time. You, the, yeah. Uh, I, according to my opinion, it doesn't matter if you, I mean, you don't need to wait more than one minute. I mean, there's so little you can gain by waiting more than one minute. There's so little extra blood. Uh, so. So that's my opinion. Uh, but if you look into the literature, for instance, the Cochrane review about delayed cord clamping, you see there's a long list of definitions of delayed cord clamping. Three minutes, five minutes, until there's no pulsation in the cord. Uh, and I think we should make it simple and say, well, we can say 60 seconds, for instance. Or maybe in the future say, until the baby started breathing, breathe. So uh, I'm not sure Angela really looked into the effect of cord clamping alone. But, but I, 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 I think her approach is uh, extremely interesting. Uh, and I really supported her approach many times.